Well, good morning. Get your Bibles. Go to Proverbs chapter 1. We're going to launch today a new series on uh, wisdom from the book of Proverbs itself. Uh, the Old Testament, of course, is what Jesus himself quoted from, so it's always a good uh, time to stop by and check out the words that he would use uh, as he had his life on this earth. Solomon was a collector of wise sayings, not just the guy that wrote them, he collected them. Uh, a summary there is if you want to be a wise person, hang out with wise people. Uh, talk to folks who know more than you, don't be the smartest guy you know, and learn from them every day of your life because that's what he modeled for us. Having said that, there was a time in his life he was the wisest guy on the entire earth. And then he became the dumbest guy. What happened? Real simple. When he put God at the center, he was a wise guy. When he put himself at the center, he became a fool. So when you put God at the center of your life, you become a wise person. Put, put yourself at the center, become a fool. It's just that simple. He had God at the center of all things. Life was great. He's rock and rolling. The kingdom is great. He's blessed, prosperous. God's doing great stuff through his life. And then he takes God out, puts himself in, and it all comes tumbling down. It's real easy in life. If you want a good life and a wise life, put God at the center of your life. It's just that simple. Everybody say, God. Come on, say, God at the center. Now, from the beginning of time, we've been trying to build our life on ourselves. We do this all the time. We think everything is about us, and we fail time and time and time again at this, don't we? The Bible tells us that wisdom itself is from God. In fact, Jesus modeled for us wisdom and truth, grace and truth. When he taught at the synagogues, the folks around Christ were going, man, this guy's smart. Never seen a guy like this before in our entire life. Where did he get this from? Well, Jesus lived his life with God at the center. When you put God at the center of all things, you will live a wise life. Every one of us today is on a path somewhere, going someplace. We may feel stuck in life, in a place of difficulty or trapped, but the truth is this, we're always in motion. You never actually stop. You're going somewhere every day. You may think you've paused, but you're really moving more than you know sometimes. Life is a journey itself. In fact, in this life, the end of it all is not just a place, but a condition. God doesn't want you just to drag yourself through your life and barely squeeze into heaven. God wants you to have a good life, an abundant life, and a blessed life because you make wise choices and experience the blessing and favor of God. Who would like to have a blessed life because you make wise choices? Put your hand up high real fast. Come on, all of us today, my hands are up right now too. I want a good life. If I want a good life, I've got to make wise choices in life. The Bible itself is the voice of God inviting us into an abundant and eternal plan for our life that he has. Now, in the Old Testament, God would speak to us in three main ways. He would, of course, use his prophets. They would give his predictions, his repentance messages. He would use his priests to teach his laws, uh, the laws of God themselves. And then he would use sages or wise men to give us counsel. So God has always given to us principles to live by, teachings, laws to live by, God gives us a declaration of prophets for our life, what's going to happen next, but then God also gives us counsel. All of us need counsel in life because we all live a life that we can't see everything. Life itself is somewhat like navigating through a corn maze. Who has ever in your life done a corn maze? Put your hand up high. Why? Don't go in there. People go missing. Never come back out the other side. But think of it this way. Just think if you're uh, going to go into a corn maze with some friends or for a fall festival somewhere, and you, and you start to walk in the corn maze, it all looks the same, doesn't it? Well, which way do I go? Do I go left? Do I go right? Do I go forward? Do I go backwards? Now, imagine how much easier it would be if someone was kind of up here looking out of a, of a lofty area that could see the entire maze. And then they could radio down, hey, go left. And so you go left. Hey, go forward. And so you go forward. Hey, go backward. And so you go backward. Hey, turn right. So you turn right. You would get to, to the end really fast, wouldn't you? Do you realize that God's word is just that? You have a God who's eternal, who's up in heaven right now, who gave you this book. It's like he's up in the, in the high loft area looking down at your life and at my life saying, go left. Go right. Back up. Show mercy. Forgive. Love. Serve. But we get in a fix when we say, I don't want to go left, I want to go right, God. I'm not feeling left. Today isn't a left day, today is a right day. I'm not, I'm not thinking, so I think I want to go my direction. 
And that's why we end up in messes and fixes in life because we hear the word of God and we don't do what it says. This is God's book to you and to me. If you want a wise life, start right here. This book has tremendous counsel for your life, tremendous wisdom that it can pass on to you for every circumstance. And if you'll go left when God says left, I promise you, life turns out a whole lot better. Can I get an amen? I always tell my kids, listen, guys, if you'll just listen to me, it'll be a whole lot smoother around the entire house. I mean, if we could just avoid the discussion, the debate, the argument, the, the slow responses, the, you know, the, uh, you know. You ever, you ever tell your kids to go do something? It's kind of like you're there, like, dragging concrete through the floor, you know, like, oh, oh. And just can barely, you know, barely can make it there. And, and you want to say to yourself, you're going to do it. Just go get it done. And, and, and how many of you know that, that because you're in charge as the parent, you're going to win in the end? I mean, you're going to win no matter what you have to go through to get there. I mean, if it's a struggle, it's a struggle. If it's a discipline, it's a discipline. If I get a ground, yeah, it's fine. But at the end of the day, because I have the power, because I have the money, because I have the authority, because this is my house, I will win in the end. And all the parents said amen. amen. Got to team up against our kids nowadays. It's the same with God. Why do, we, why do we think that we can argue with God above and come out winners? God sees everything. God knows everything. God's given us a book with everything in mind. God knows our beginning, our end, our, our middle, our front, our back, our left, our right. He knows, knows every, every part of your life. He is omniscient. He's omnipotent. He is all-seeing. He's everywhere. And still we want to discuss it and debate with God. Listen to me. Just like in your house, God wins in the end. Everybody say, God. Come on, say, God wins in the end. So if you want to be on the winning team, you need to get on God's team because God always wins in the end, and that's how you guarantee you can win in your life too if you do life God's way because God's up here looking down saying go left, go right, go frontward, go backward, turn around, go the wrong direction, and if you'll do life that way, I promise you, you will win in the end. Can I get an amen today? You'll win every time. If you do it God's way. So that's kind of the picture we see in our life that God's looking kind of out over the, 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 the landscape of life or the balcony of heaven going, hey guys, go in the wrong direction. You need to take a left or take a right. Go this way, go that way. The hope for our series is simply this, that we can escape the fool from within by reaching out for the God above and put him at the center of our life. Now, just for clarity, all of us have a fool on the inside. Let's just do a little survey, a little show of hands. Who in the house today has ever done something foolish? Put your hand up high. Okay? All right. Who's done the same foolish thing more than once? Put your hand back up high. We don't learn, do we? We don't learn, do we? Now, some things you learn. I'll never forget this as a little kid. I've told this before. I, I put my finger in the, or my thumb in the end of the cigarette lighter. Yeah, I know. It's stupid, isn't it? And, and I'm thinking this day, I'm thinking, what was I thinking? Well, the problem is I wasn't thinking. I was drawn by the light. That red circle. Hey, what's it doing? What's it doing? I think I can. I uh, ah! I learned a lesson. I'll never forget the time I had to take a boat out. I'm not a boating kind of guy. And you've heard this before as well. And so a, a guy in the church would be trying to be nice to me and my family. We were down at one of the lakes here somewhere uh, down at uh, Hot Springs. almost said Palm Springs. Down, down at Hot Springs. And he goes, I got a boat, go pick it up, take it up. I thought, well, I got a hitch. That means I can get a boat. So I went and got the boat, took it to the dock, put it in the water, get the boat off the, uh, the, the trailer, thank you, the rack, and the trailer. <laughs> Y'all see how deficient I am. And so I get it off the trailer, put it in the water, get the kids loaded up, and we're taking on water. Now I'm thinking, this is not a good idea. Water should be outside the boat, not inside the boat. I do know that much. And so we get the boat back up on the thing. And so I called the guy. I said, man, we're taking on water. This isn't good. I got it back up on the trailer, and I got it back up, got the water coming out of the boat. He goes, did you put the plug in? I said, what plug? He goes, there's a plug on the back of the boat. I said, a plug on a boat? He said, yeah, there's a hole in the back of the boat. I said, no, hold on a second. You're telling me there's a plug in the back of the boat? He said, yes. I said, is this a boat or a bathtub? I don't want a hole in the boat. I want a boat with no holes in it. Now, 
example, I had no wisdom, no knowledge, had never taken a boat out by myself in my life, and this guy gives me his boat, and we about drown the thing. I didn't know anything. Now, I know from now on to look for the plug in the back of the boat. Can I get an amen? That's important to do. I didn't know that, though, but I do now. So wisdom is when you learn things or you hear things from the Word of God. In fact, the best counsel you ever come across in your life is the stuff that God's Word tells you. Because the other wisdom often comes the hard route. And I, I can tell you in life, you're going to face times, if you don't get it God's way the first time, you'll face some difficulty. I can promise you that. Now, the whole idea and application of God is simply this. It's understanding that He is the one that decided He is God. And he has decided he's already central to the cause of all things. We don't vote God in. We don't vote God out. My sons did not vote me in as dad. I am the cause of their existence. If there is no me, they're not here. Y'all know that, right? We didn't vote God in. We can't vote God out. He is the central cause of all things. If there is no God, we're not here. So... The point is this, my confessions, practices, and more don't make him God, but they do make him my God. He's already God. He will win in the end. And if you want to win, you have to do it God's way. But you have to put him at the center of all things and make him your God, and that's how you get the benefits of making him Lord of your life. Go to Proverbs chapter 1, verse 2. Here we go. This is the first chapter of the book of Proverbs, and the first nine books are kind of a case for wisdom. Why you need wisdom in life. And all of us need counsel, certainly. All of us can benefit from somebody else telling us the path to choose in life. Verse 2 says this, To know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding, to receive instruction of wisdom, justice, judgment, and equity, to give prudence to the simple, to the young man knowledge and discretion, a wise man will hear and increase learning. A man of understanding will attain wise counsel to understand a proverb and an enigma, the words of the wise and their riddles. Verse 7, the fear of the Lord. Everybody say the fear of the Lord. Come on, say the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools, everybody say fool. Come on, Mr. T, it up. Come on, fool. Yeah, Mr. T, I, I need my jewelry right now and the mohawk going on. Fool. But a fool will despise wisdom and instruction. So what's it mean to fear the Lord? Does it mean to be afraid like a scary movie? Does it mean to be afraid like being afraid of the dark? Who in the house today, you were ever afraid of the dark? Put your hand up. Come on. All of us. Me too. I was afraid of the dark. I, I sleep with the closet light on until about 25 years of age. And I, I'm just not, not, not that long. I was afraid of the dark. In fact, my mom... You know, we didn't have air in the house growing up, and my mom, who's here today, I came, she came one night, and I had my windows closed. It was hot in Ohio, and we opened our windows at night, and I closed my windows, and she said, Marty, why is your windows closed? I said, Mom, because someone may come and get me. And she goes, I promise you they'll bring you back. So i um, <laughs> not sure what that meant, but that helped my fear issues. So here's what it means to fear the Lord. Here we go. Listen close. To, to be open to him. Openness to him. Are you open to God speaking into your life? Do you come into the church to hear the word of God? Do you come in like this? Or do you come in like this? Do you come in with a heart that says, I want to learn, I want to grow, I want to know? Or do you come in going, let's see what he's got to say. Come on, uh, I got my life figured out. You know, one of the great things in life that affects learning is a thing called receptivity. And I can tell you one of the big progressions over me in elementary school and me in junior high and high school versus me in college years was an issue called receptivity. Not the teachers, but just a heart that wanted to hear and listen. And you may come into the house of God time and time again and get nothing because if you come in like this, I can just tell you, you're going to walk out just like this. But if you come in like this and you long to hear the word of God and let God speak to your life, God can change your life. See, to fear God is to be open to God. To fear him is to be eager to please him. I will tell you this, fear itself and Pleasing God itself is not always a single motivator, but it is a motivator. I, I, I don't want to live a life that's afraid of God in the sense of I don't want to make every choice out of my fear, but I do want to make a choice out of pleasing God. I, I want to please the God who gave me life. 
I want to please the God who gave me breath. I want to please the God who gave me health, who gave me existence. I want to please the God who's forgiven my sins, give me hope everlasting. I want to please that God because I realize all he's done for me. And so I want to live a life that pleases God. And that's fearing God. That's, please, that's pleasing him every day. Fearing the Lord is, is, a, is a humility to be instructed by him. Fearing the Lord is a turning from evil and changing your ways. For too many people, we stay in the same patterns. You've got to change your ways. That's kind of, kind of what repentance is. It's changing your, your sinful direction in life. That's repentance. That's fearing the Lord. Fearing him is surrendering to his will. If, if, if the Son of God himself had to pray, not my will but yours be done, how much more do we got to pray, not my will but yours be done? How often in life do we let our will trump out his will and our will overtake his will for our life? And you can even get your will and say it was God's will. I've seen people live out their will and go, well, God spoke. That wasn't God's plan. I'm going to tell you now, if it doesn't line up with God's book, it's not God's plan. Well, I, I prayed about it. I'm sure you did. You prayed your will be done, not his will be done. Fearing God is loving God. Fearing God is fitting together with the body of Christ. Fearing God is realizing that he is God and I am not. Heard it said great last night by a friend in the church, a man in the church. Uh, he said, I heard this years ago. I want to share it with you. When I made that point, he said, God will not sit in the throne you won't get out of. I thought, wow, that's a pretty good statement. And of course, that guy's a Buckeye fan too. That'd be even better to hear wisdom from a Buckeye fan. That's a good thing. Because God speaks to those of like wisdom. You're not getting on page with that at all. I see that. That's okay. God still loves you. But think about that. God won't sit in the throne you won't get out of. We've got to really have a significant cultural mind shift today that says, I'm not really king of my life. He is. I'm not Lord. He is. I'm not right. He is. He knows better than I know. If, if you're not careful, life can go by fast, and you can think that God is dumb and you're smart, and that's a horrible place to be, trusting God. So fearing him is realizing that he is God and I am not. Now, we just ended a series called, about picking the right path, and nothing impacts the path we choose like the voices we hear and obey every day. In fact, Proverbs itself kind of gives a picture that, that there's two voices talking. There's, there's wisdom from above and wisdom from the earth. In fact, all of Scripture is kind of a conflict of two different voices. Who are you going to listen to? There's earthly counsel, but there's also a thing called heavenly counsel. There's counsel from above and counsel from here on this earth. And I would challenge you today across this house and those watching online, be sure you're listening much more to God's book than you are to Facebook. Be sure you're dialed into what God has to say, not just what your best friend has to say. And always ask yourself the question, what does God say about this? Because Proverbs is reality-based counsel for living in a world that's filled with clashes and chaos every day. Have you ever noticed how messed up our society is? The headlines, what gets our attention, what gets our talking points. Have you ever noticed how messed up it is? And you could take every area and just kind of go back to the lack of wisdom in use. Saying dumb things, saying the wrong thing. Wisdom knows when to speak and when to be quiet. As a survey, who has ever spoken at the wrong time? Put your hand up high. My hand is up right now. Who's ever said something dumb? Put your hand back up high. When you talk for a living, you say dumb stuff all the time. Okay? No need to tell me. No need to email me. I got it figured out. I know before you know it. I know when it leaves the airport it was dumb. I just can't get it back in. And it's already flying. And then if I miss it, my wife is great at saying, Marty, that was dumb. How many thank God for wives that make us better husbands? Come on. Who thanks God today? Come on. You got to praise for wives that make us better men. That's right. Yeah. And so you ain't got to tell me. You ain't got to email. You ain't got to call the church. Did you, know the, did you know the pastor? Yes, he knows. I just want to make sure you understand. I understand. I was there. I saw the whole thing. It happened before my own eyes. Wisdom helps you know when to be quiet, when to talk, when to listen. Wisdom is counsel for living every day. Just out of curiosity, who today in your life right now, you could use some wisdom. Put your hand up high. My hand is up. I've got to face decisions in my life and choices for the future that I need God to counsel me on. I don't, I don't want to just do what I want to do. I want to do what God wants me to do. So no matter where you are today, whatever choice you've got to make, you can find a way to do it in God's plan. Now go to Proverbs chapter 1, verse 22. I'll read you two verses here. This first verse brings out three types of people seeing Proverbs throughout the series. 
We want to break them down for you today so you kind of have a bearing on our context of conversation. Verse 22, how long will you simple ones, everybody say simple. How long will you simple ones love simplicity? For scorners, everybody say scorners. That's the second category, delight in their scorning. And then it says, and how, many, and how are you fools, how long will you hate knowledge? Everybody say fools. So here we have simple, everybody say simple. Everybody say scornful. Everybody say foolish. Three types of people we see in this. And then we see a beckoning call from wisdom. And wisdom is saying to us here, he says, turn at my rebuke. Listen, if you're these three people, listen, just turn, turn at my rebuke, and surely I'll pour out my spirit upon you, and I'll make my words known to you. No matter where you are today, you can be a fool, you can be scornful, or you can be a, listen, you can be a simple person. If you'll turn back to wisdom, God can change your life. He can change your future today. I can't fix the mess you're already in, but we can get you on a better path to have less messes in life. Who could go for less messes in life? Come on, I could certainly do that in my own life. In fact, I will tell you this, in my lifetime, one of the biggest pains in my life one of the biggest challenges I've ever faced in my entire life came from a situation where I didn't have the insight and the wisdom I should have had. My heart was right. My intention was pure and good, but I didn't see stuff. I could see it now, but I couldn't see it then. Wouldn't it be cool to think that we could all bring an end to those things in life if we just had a little bit more godly counsel in our life? Let's discuss three people. Here we go, number one, the simple guy. Simple people are uninformed, but they're also uncommitted. Now think about that word today, uncommitted. Today as a people, we live in the land of the free and the home of the uncommitted. Have you ever seen as a culture commitment be at such a low level? We're uncommitted to our marriages, uncommitted to our families, uncommitted to our churches, uncommitted to our employers, our schools, our government, the list goes on. As a people, as a whole, maybe not you, but as a general population, we are very uncommitted people. We see ourselves at the center of all things. If it doesn't benefit me directly, I'm against it. Because if I don't get the, the, the benefits, I'm out. Because I must be happy. Now just think about this. The book of James tells us that an uncommitted or an unstable man or a guy that wants both the world and God is unstable in all his ways. So watch the progression here. Uninformed leads to uncommitted, which leads to unstable. And watch this today. If you're not committed, you'll be quick to conform to anything else. One of the strong points in my Christian walk that keeps me on the right path to following Jesus as my Lord and Savior is the fact I'm committed to him and nothing else. That's how you survive in a marriage for all these years. You just pick one person and stay put. You just stay right there. I made a commitment 24 years ago, never have moved off of it. Didn't know I, didn't, didn't know I could. I can't. I'm here. I'm stuck. I'm not going anywhere. I like this. I'm staying right in this lane. This is my lane. I'm staying right here in this lane. Think of it this way. The Christian life requires a thing called commitment. If you don't commit to Christ, you will conform to this world. And the Bible says to not be conformed, but to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. If I don't commit everything to God, I'll conform to anything because the culture and the sinful society is pulling at me every day. I've got to commit and stay in my lane in my walk with Jesus. That's how this works for us. That's the simple guy. What about this, the scornful guy? This is the guy who is self-confident, loves to fight, and they love social media platforms. Stay away from fights on social media platforms. All of us have messed it up at least once, but don't do it again. Learn the first time. Just stay away. Just sit back and laugh and put out smiley faces. Stir the pot like I like to do. Just laughing. Just stop by to laugh at all of you. Have a great day. A scoffer, a scornful person, they love to fight, love to debate. What about the fool? The fool is a thick-headed guy that won't listen to anybody. You know, listening is a huge part of wise living. Who do you listen to every day? Who's your counsel circle? Who are the people that speak into your life? I know as a parent, I want to watch my kids' friends. I don't want my, my kids having fools for friends. 
You hang out with fools, you become a fool. Hang out with the wise, become the wise. That's in the Bible as well, by the way. Hang out with sinners, become a sinner. It's just that simple. Who you hang with is so important for your life. And so we look at these three people, and then we realize the price that they pay. In fact, Proverbs chapter 9 says this. It says, if you correct a mocker, they're going to hate you. Correct the wise, and they will love you. Instruct the wise, they'll be even wiser. Teach the righteous, and they will learn even more. For the fear of the Lord is a foundation of wisdom. Knowledge of the Holy One, it results in good judgment. Wisdom will multiply your days and add years to your life. Who would like to have long days? Put your hand up high and say, yes. If you would, right there it is. Wisdom. Want to live a long life? Be wise. Be wise with your body. Be wise in your relationship. Be wise with your finances. Be wise. Wisdom will prolong your days. The Bible promises that to us right there. As you keep reading chapter 1, we see kind of the cost that you pay if you don't turn back to wisdom. The first thing is calamity. This is chapter 1, verse 26. It says calamity will come upon you. Calamity issues, terror comes upon you, storms, destruction, distress, anguish, pause for a second. If you're facing difficulty in life, I can almost guarantee you, you can back it up and find a place in which you miss the turnoff for the wise choice. On the road of stupidity, there was a turning point to choose the road of wisdom. But if you ignore the wise choice, you end up on the path of the foolish. Think of your life, what's stressing you today, what's your frustration, what's your pain. I can look back right now, and I can see where I could have turned off a different path and had a different outcome. I can't fix it. I'm here. I can't go backwards. I'm here. But I can look back and go, oh, I can see that now. And here's why. Wisdom helps you see going forward what is so evident looking backwards. That's wisdom. Wouldn't it be great if you could see your future from the present and not just looking back toward the past. If you could see who to marry. I was talking to a person the other day that made some choices that, man, their life is in a mess right now. And, and, and I can't fix the mess because it's already here. But man, if we could take them back and just say, hey, if you'll listen to so-and-so's counsel and don't marry that person or don't make a baby with that person, life would be a whole lot different. By the way, just FYI, free information here, you get married and then you make a baby. That's how this works. Can I get an amen? That's all free counsel. That's God's plan. It always works if you do it God's way. So get married and then make a baby, just so you know. But a lot of folks don't do that. They try their own path, and that's how life gets difficult. If, if, if you'll just come back and do it God's way, and I know you might be saying, oh, man, God's way is kind of a boring way. Well, you know what? A good golf game is boring too, but you score a whole lot lower. Yeah, the Christian life might be viewed as boring, well, all the fun you're going to miss. You mean know, all the misery, all the terror, all the calamity, all the destruction, all the heartbreak? And I'm not here to tell you that, that, that God hates you if you're in these fixes. I'm, I'm telling you, start a wise path today and get out of the messes. Stop making poor choices today and get on the path God has for you. Correct it today. Start right now. Fix right now. And do better going forward. So if you live your life by God's principles and his word and his, his wisdom, you'll be shocked how God can lead your life. So what's a wise life look like? What's a wisdom look like? Here we go. Number one, quickly, wisdom is centering your life upon the Lord. It's just that simple. And, and the best picture I have of this for us to talk about today is, is, a, is a marital dynamic because the scripture itself gives a parallel to Christian life and marriage. It's in the Bible, Ephesians chapter 5. So I know this. I'm a married guy. And I can tell you that my wife, she's the center of all things, literally the center of all things, and she affects everything. Everything I think, everything I spend, where I go, how I talk, how I walk, my, my, everything in my life is impacted by my wife, and that's how God does too. To put God at the center means he affects everything. Too many of us put God in parts of our life, but never give him the, give, give him the center of our life. So it isn't just he's center of the church service. It isn't he's just the center of the moment today. He's the center of Monday morning, Tuesday morning, Wednesday morning, Thursday morning, Friday morning, Saturday, Friday night, Saturday night. He's the center of all things. That's how God set this up. That's what it means to put God the center of all things in your life. He's in every thought. He's in every expense. He's in every time. He's in every place. He's part of everything. Nowhere can I go in this life that I'm not a married man. Is that true or false? That's true. I could be in Alaska, my wife could be in Arkansas, and I'm still a married man. Is that true? 
So, watch this. Nowhere can I go in life and not be a Christian. I'm not a Christian here, somebody else out there. I'm the same guy here I am out there. That's how God works at the center of my life. So wisdom itself is putting God at the center. Also this, wisdom is looking to God's word. When you have to make a decision in life, have you looked at the word of God? What does the Bible say about this? Not what does your friend think? Well, I talked to someone, so then they bring an idea. Well, okay, that's great. What does the Bible say? I don't know. You don't know. Well, what's the Bible say? Oh, I'm not for sure. I'm thinking about leaving my wife. Okay, who'd you talk to? Well, my buddy. Well, what'd he think? Well, he, he left his a couple years ago. He's good with it. Okay, what's God think? I don't know, I ain't got there yet. You ain't got the God's word yet? If you're going to make a life decision, get in the word of God. I'm thinking about moving to a different state and going working for a company. Okay, what's the Bible say? Haven't checked it yet. Folks, we've got to look because this is the book that's at the bird's eye view above our corn maze of life telling us which way to go. Should I marry so-and-so? Well, it doesn't say Tom or Stephen here, but it does tell you what kind of person to marry. And the Bible does encourage folks who are good workers and to make a living. Well, he don't have a job. He's been trying to get a good job. Then he ain't your guy. Because this book says don't marry a guy who can't get a J-O-B. I can find it for you, I promise you, it's in there. Don't marry a girl who's been with everybody else across town. It's right here. Proverbs 5, 6, and 7. We'll get it next week, don't worry, it's going to be a great study. You don't want to miss next week, I promise you. It'll be mildly PG-13-ish, maybe 14. It's all here. Do you know that God has given us this book to help us navigate life a whole lot better? Wisdom is listening to the Word of God. Now, the, 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 the imperative here is not just hearing it, but doing it. So right now, you're hearing me talk because you're in the room or you're watching online. You can hear me talk, but are you listening? If you've parented, you understand there's a difference in listening and listening. If you're a wife, you understand there's a difference in listening and listening. Can I get an amen, wives? You don't hear what I say, huh? Were you talking? Yes, I was talking to you. You were talking to me? Sorry, I missed all that. Listening to the Word of God is hearing it and then following suit with it. Doing it. Wisdom, listen close, is living aligned with the Word of God. In fact, in Proverbs chapter 1, verse 10, it says, When sinners entice you, my son, don't go with them. Don't be pulled by these guys. Stay away because destruction is their path. Nothing examples, listen close, our reverence for the Lord like our lack of response to God's word. If you can't respond to God's word, you don't reverence the Lord. It's just that simple. Because this is his book to us. And if we ignore this, we ignore him. So how do you turn around today? Maybe you're in a fix. Maybe you're in a mess right today. Number one, you've got to repent. You've got to repent from your ways. Realize you're not God and he is. Go God's way, not your way. You've got to make a choice right now. What's the Bible say? Not just does it look good, does it feel good. That's all can come into play later on. But listen, start with what the Bible says. Start right here. What kind of place you going to? All of us make life choices. But maybe you've gotten in the fix too many times. Then, then repent and go back to God. Now the picture here is a turning away from some things. Not staying on the same path. You won't find the righteous outcome on the path of sin. Get back on God's path today. Don't, don't navigate the sinful road trying to find heaven at the other end. It doesn't work that way. If you know you're on the wrong path, get off that path and get on the right path today. And from there, get to the right place. Number two, quickly, relationship. Wisdom comes through relationship. People that know you, people you know, that can speak in your life. I have mentors in my life. I have a, a mentor friend who's in uh, pastor a church for years in Kansas City, and he and I would talk on a regular basis. He's been a lifeline in my life as a pastor. He's been so helpful to me. And he knows me, and I know him. He knows where I'm at in ministry. He knows the church I'm at. And so when he would talk, I would listen because he had good counsel. And I could tell you this. The times I listened, I was better off for it. The times I didn't, I paid the price. Because I was foolish, and a fool always pays a price. Maybe today you're in a place where 
You're not where you need to be in, in relationship to the church, the body of Christ. We're about to launch small groups coming up, and that's so important for living a good life, a wise life. The people you hang out with are so vital to you. You want to be healthy, find healthy folks. You want to be rich, find rich folks. You want to be smart, find smart folks. You want to be spiritual, find spiritual folks. Listen, the folks you hang with are everything to the kind of life you live and the kind of life you lead. Relationship matters. Join a small group. Connect through the growth track. Become part of the church. Don't just stay in the peripheral. Come into what God has because God wants to give you wisdom, and we do it together. Number three in closing out, it's a word called reverence. Let's just rewind this back a little bit to the idea of being God. God is God. We don't make him God. I don't make this the word of God. This is already the word of God. Now, I can make it the word of my God if I obey. I can make him my God if I honor him, worship him, glorify him, obey him. That makes him my God. But reverence is so key today. We're somewhat irreverent about the things of God. Let, let me give you a picture of this. Let me give you this example of this. I love it. It's in the book of Job. They're having a fight, having an argument, and, and God's like, Job, where were you? When I fashioned all this. You didn't do this. So next time you go to argue with God's word, just ask yourself, where were you when God created the earth? Where were you today when God picked up the sun and said, okay, sun, time to shine? Where were you last night when God spat up the stars and threw them across the skyline? Where were you when that breeze came by the house that God put upon your family? Where were you when God made the flowers grow, made the mountains come up out and the seas go low? Where were you? We're nothing compared to God. And it's time we go back to reverencing God to the place and when he speaks, we just go, yes. Because he's going to win in the end. And if you want to win, you've got to get on God's team. Go to Psalm chapter 19. Look at this, verse 7 through 11. I love this short text. We'll close out quickly today. It says, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is pure, sure, making wise the simple the statutes of the Lord are right, rejoice in the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Watch this close, verse 10 and 11. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, that much fine gold, sweeter also than the honey and the honeycomb. Verse 11, moreover by them your servant is warned, and in keeping them there is a great, everybody say a reward. Reward for your life. You want a rewarding life? Wisdom brings great reward. Now, who today needs wisdom? Hand up high real fast. I'm going to pray for you. Maybe you've got to make a choice. My hand is up, by the way. I've got a choice I've got to make in my life coming up. I need wisdom from God. Keep your hand up high. I'm going to pray for you right now. Maybe it's a marital situation. Maybe it's finance. Maybe it's family. Maybe it's career. Maybe it's church. Maybe it's serving. Maybe it's selling. Maybe it's buying. You need wisdom. Hand up high. I'm going to pray for you right now. Father, I thank you for every hand I've got, all these hands today. God, we need you to speak into our life. We don't know what to do without you guiding us. We're trying to navigate the corn maze of life. God, tell us, go left, go right, go front, go back. You speak, and we'll listen. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.